Okay, so before you see this movie, you should probably check out some required viewing. I am not kidding. Sparkle, sparkle, sparkle. Dude, I don't even know you! Brad Pitt has a bad case of mistaken identity. Everyone thinks he's an assassin. Which he is, but it's a different assassin in Bullet Train. So again, like a lot of trailers this year, what you probably think this movie is gonna be, you're probably right about. It's kind of a mix of a lot of dialogue heavy quirky films like Quentin Tarantino and Elmore Leonard, screwball comedies and farces like Bringing Up Baby and What's Up Doc, and super violent stylized action films like Kill Bill and Deadpool, which makes sense because I directed this, also directed Deadpool too. There is even a character whose superpower is being really lucky. <laughs> and it's pretty damn decent at two out of three of these. So the action in this, as you would expect, is a lot of fun. This looks nice, it's creative, it's an interesting scenario having like these fight sequences on a train. The super complicated story is probably the best part of the film. I'm watching this and seeing all these different characters enter this train. I'm saying to myself, how are they all gonna connect? How's this all gonna come together at the end? And it surprisingly really does in a clever, smart way where every character character somehow has some sort of major part to play. Even ones that seem to be in it for just a second have kind of a big part in the grand scheme of things, and it's really, really tied together nicely. The one area where it falls short, sadly, and it is a pretty big one, is the dialogue. The dialogue isn't that funny. And this isn't a painfully unfunny movie, but it is something where you listen to this and you say, oh, I remember this kind of talking from 30 years ago. And back then, that would have been really fresh if like a Kevin Smith was in charge of this or a Barry Sonnenfeld or like I mentioned before, a Quentin Tarantino. But this is writing where it feels like it's always building up to a good punchline. And then you realize, oh, this writing is the punchline. A perfect example is that there's a big action scene happening at the end. One character says to the other while he's fighting off bad guys, I'm sorry I stabbed you. And the other character says, you stabbed me twice. And as he's still fighting, he says, I'm sorry I stabbed you twice. Okay. Okay, what's this building to? That was it. That was the punchline. That's the area where you were supposed to laugh. You stab me? Yeah, there's a lot of dialogue like that. Like, I'm saying the thing that you just did? I, if that does it for you. There is a character in this who is obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine. And at first, that's kind of cute and kind of funny. And in a unique way, it does actually tie in to a very dramatic moment later. And I like all that. But every single time this character brings up Thomas the Tank Engine, it isn't just three or four times, even that sounds like a little much. It's something like 10 or 12 times in this movie. And every single time he brings it up, almost nothing new is added to it. The fact that he likes Thomas the Tank Engine is the joke and it almost never evolved. This is a movie that has a bad case of being overwritten. And overwritten is not always bad. Early Christopher Nolan and early Wachowskis, I think is very good overwriting. Later Christopher Nolan and later Wachowskis, I don't think is very good overwriting. And this is a case of, at the very least, it's not too pretentious. It has that going for it. It does have a good sense of humor, but when it actually comes to the dialogue that we're supposed to be laughing at how comical these characters are, it doesn't usually work. And another good example is that there's a scene where these uh, two twins, I say that in quotes, are talking about how many kills they got. And this is like in the first 10 minutes of the movie. They're talking about how many kills they've gotten since they started this mission and they have a little argument about it. Okay, well, where's this going? What it builds up to is that it literally shows every single kill they've done. By the way, it's 17, so you have to sit there and watch all 17 kills, and they're not that funny, they're not that new, they're not that original, and the story hasn't even really gotten going yet, and it thinks that it's throwing something really clever and quippy in there, and it's just kind of falling flat. It's the quiet car. All right, so that's another example of not going all the way with the joke. And what I mean is, this is a weird comparison, but you ever see the movie Storks? There's a scene where they have to fight, but a baby is sleeping, so they do an entire action sequence whispering. With this, they're on the quiet car, and anytime they make a sound, somebody goes, shh, 
So you would think the whole thing would be done in silence, or at least the action would be relatively quiet. But it's not. Everything is still super loud, the thuds are loud, everything is just magnified in terms of volume. <laughs> But the idea is still not a bad idea, so it's hard to say it's bad, it's just not great. However, what saves it is the acting. The acting in this movie is what brings these characters to life. I'm not gonna lie, the first maybe 20 minutes of this movie I thought, oh no, am I not gonna enjoy this? Is, it, is the dialogue just gonna destroy the whole thing? But when the characters start going into different cars and they stop over-introducing themselves and just listening to themselves talk and show off their vocabulary, when the characters are actually interacting off each other and getting the story going, it is pretty fun. And I really think that is the performances and the style of the film. This movie, like I said, has a lot going on, but it's pretty damn good at holding your hand in just the right way. And a lot of that comes to this clever editing, where every single time they'll say a character's name, maybe it'll flash really quickly to a flashback you saw earlier, or maybe if, a, if an animal gets loose, again, this is kind of like bringing a baby, it'll cut back to that animal several times. It's always very good at keeping this enjoyably super complicated story to a point where you can follow it just enough, where you like the fact that you're asking yourself, oh wait, what did that character do? And where's this character now? Hey, what happened to this person? That's kind of the fun. You're kind of forgetting this character's in the story. So when they show up again, you get kind of a decent laugh and you do kind of perk up. Like, oh yeah, I like this person. I want to see how this person is going to interact with this person. So we haven't seen that yet. Do you have um, anything sparkling? Only you, you adorable. See, he's just so charming. <laughs> But had the film not spent so much time on many of these dialogue sequences that seemingly go nowhere, I feel like they could have made a lot more scenes more powerful. For example, there's, without going to spoilers, there's one character who's killed off and means a lot to another character and they give a really heartfelt goodbye scene here. Well then later that character dies and we find out the other character isn't dead so we can do that goodbye scene all over again. And I feel like you already spent your goodbye scene, why are we doing this again? Another good example is in the climax of this movie, they start playing I Need a Hero in Japanese. And that's amazing, I got so excited to think oh my god am I gonna see like an Asian version of Shrek 2, I am so excited for this, but then you guessed it, they have to make room for the dialogue, so they cut the song, and while they're fighting, they're just saying their quippy dialogue back and forth, and it really pissed me off because I think I Need a Hero would have sounded great over this climax. So I think that constantly got in the way, but once in a while there are moments where it knows when to shut up. There's one character that has a backstory, again without going into too much detail, that's done completely in silence. There's no dialogue in it whatsoever, and it is so effectively done that you can't help but laugh really hard at what the payoff is. And I think the payoff is gonna be a little divisive, it happens early in the movie, but it got a big laugh out of me. Those are the moments I think are handled best, when the scenes are really tight, and the dialogue is really tight, and they don't waste too much time, they really do a good job, just letting the natural charm of the performances really shine through. So yeah, this is another movie where I'm a little all over the map, but I have to admit, I'm glad I saw it. I just don't think I ever need to see it again, but for seeing it once on the big screen, I thought it was a decent enough time. So uh, let's give it three out of four diesels. Nothing fantastic, but worth a train ticket. With that said, what did you think? Did you feel like, no, the dialogue was great and everything flowed great and everything was tied together really nicely and the charm of the characters worked? Or did you think, no, this really was overwritten and there was too much going on, it was trying too hard to be clever? Or do you think, like me, you're somewhere in between where you feel like, yeah, some of it works, some of it doesn't, but the stuff that does work pulls it through just enough. And that's about it, and I'll see you next time. Take care.